audiobook, Simply This Moment. 18 Between the Observer and the Observed, 2. 15th of June 2005. The Buddha said that anyone who fulfills the Anapanasati meditation also completes the four Satipahana. So that means that anyone who wants to do Satipahana meditation can just carry on watching the breath. Satipahana meditation is Anapanasati meditation. It is useful to remember that Anapanasati according to the Buddha equals Satipahana. Even the first four stages of Anapanasati fulfill Kaigatasati, the mindfulness of the body. The Buddha said you don't need to do anymore. But what does that truly mean? This evening I want to explore the meaning of sati. There are two parts to mindfulness that you should always bear in mind. One part is to understand that mindfulness is the power of the mind to see what's going on. It is part of the brightness of the mind, the power of the mind to be alert, to be aware, and to pick up what is going on. Many people make the mistake of thinking that mindfulness is just mindfulness, and they don't understand and appreciate that it has different degrees of intensity and power. The normal mindfulness that people carry around in their daily lives is so weak that they hardly see anything at all. Ordinary mindfulness is the mindfulness of the ordinary person going about their daily business, sure they're aware, but they only see a portion of what's out there. One of the reasons for that is because their mind is not empowered yet. It's like going through life in semi-darkness. All they see are silhouettes and shapes, life has no texture, no detail. They've missed too much of what's going on out there. It's called dullness of the mind. When you've experienced a jana your mind is empowered and you understand what mindfulness can be. It's so sharp, so penetrating, that it's like a big searchlight. Whatever it looks at, it picks up everything. I've noticed that when I'm shaving in the morning, if there is not much light, I can't see my stubble, but if there is a bright light, if the light in the bathroom is in the right position, I can see so much stubble on my cheeks and chin. That's a little example of how, when there is little light you can't see what's really there, but when you put your glasses on and there is a big light you see so much detail. It was always there but before you couldn't notice it. That stubble stands for the defilements, they are the stubble on your sitta making it unbeautiful and ugly. So, that is the power of mindfulness. Another important thing is where you focus that mindfulness, where you direct it. Some people say you can be mindful of anything. You can be mindful when you are sweeping the ground, and when you are eating. Some people even say you can be mindful of sex and all these other crazy ideas. But, this is only being aware of the object of your consciousness. You can be aware of sweeping, you can be aware of laying a brick, you can be aware of putting food into your mouth, but that is not where mindfulness should really be put. I'm going to be really controversial here. Mindfulness should not even be on your body, that's not the point of what we are doing. We all know the Buddha's teaching on meditation if we read the suttas. According to the Buddha, in essence, Meditation is all about overcoming the five hindrances dash. Suppressing them, smashing them, to get to the jhanas, so that you can see the way things truly are. Meditation is suppressing the five hindrances, but what has mindfulness to do with the five hindrances? The path can also be described as abolishing and smashing the kyleses, that is greed, hatred and delusion, or labha, dosa and Moa. The Kribaya Jahans always talk about greed, hatred, and delusion. Here we don't mention those things enough. Certainly in my days as a young monk every talk would drum it into you, greed, hatred, and delusion. There wasn't a talk where it wasn't mentioned 10, 20, or 30 times. The right place for mindfulness. 
The point is, where do greed, hatred, and delusion live? Where do the five hindrances live? Do they live in your body? Do they live in the food you eat? Do they live in the bricks you lay or in the broom or the leaves that you are sweeping? This is an important point not only to your success as a monastic and to your harmony with friends and other monks, but also to your progress in meditation. Those hindrances do not live in the broom, nor do they live in your siddha. They live between you and those objects. It's that space between the observer and the object that needs watching. It's not what you are doing but how you are doing it that is important. That is where Mara plays. That is where the defilements live. That is the playground of greed, hatred, and delusion. Too often people put their mindfulness on the object or they put their mindfulness on the observer. They don't look at the middle, in between them dash. At the doing, the controlling, the ill will, and the aversion. That's the reason I told somebody today the story of a John Samito. When he was first in Wat Pa Pong he was having a hard time, and a John chasked him, is Wat Pa Pong suffering? Is Wat Pa Pong Dukka, Samito? A John Samito wasn't an A John. Then, it was of course obvious to a John Samito that Wat Pa Pong is not suffering. So, what is suffering? Is the Siddha suffering? The suffering was how a John Samito was regarding suffering. At that point he was adding it onto the experience. And if we don't put mindfulness in its right place then we miss that. We think it's Wapa Pong's fault, so we want to leave that monastery. We think it's our fault so we want to destroy ourselves or get into a guilt trip. This is wrong mindfulness, we're putting it in the wrong place. It's not the monastery's fault, and it's not the fault of that monk who is upsetting you. You are putting mindfulness in the wrong place if you put all of your focus on the object and think that is the cause of suffering. If you think the way to find liberation is to put mindfulness on the objects of your senses or to put it on who's watching or what's watching, that will never get you anywhere. We have to put the focus of our mindfulness on the space between the observer and the observed. That's where you find the play of greed and hatred, desires and aversions, wanting and disliking, and that's where you start to make something of this world which is not inherent in it. In the very early days when the villagers had just discovered generators, amplifiers and loudspeakers, there were big noisy parties close to Wat Pa Nanashat in Bung Way Village. It was so loud that it would be like having a ghetto blaster playing loud music right inside your hut. You couldn't sleep and meditation was very hard. The noise would go on until 3 o'clock in the morning, and by the time they had quietened down, that was the time the bell went for you to get up. So we hardly slept. When those parties were on, First of all we complained to the villagers and said to the headman of the village, Look, we are monks and you are supposed to be looking after us, yet there is this loud music all night. Please turn it down or at least stop at 12 o'clock to give us two hours sleep. But they would never listen to us. We thought they might listen to a John Che. So we asked a John Che, Can you please? Tell those villagers to turn the music down for a couple of hours. They would probably have listened to a John Che, but all a John Cha said was, It's not the sound that disturbs you, it's you disturbing the sound. That was a powerful teaching. On mindfulness, the world never disturbs you, it's you disturbing the world. It's what you put in between you and the world that creates the problem. It's not the fault of the world, and it's not your fault, it's the disturbance that your delusion puts in the middle. Looking at the hindrances. When you put your mindfulness in the middle, then it's not what you are doing that matters but how you are relating to it. So please, put your mindfulness into the 
relationship that you have with the objects of mind in every moment. When you know where mindfulness should be put, the path of meditation, the path of liberation, becomes very clear to you. You are looking directly at the hindrances, you are looking directly at the defilements. Desire is your relationship between the Siddha and what you are experiencing, and the same for ill will I want, I don't want, craving, that's where the attachments are. It's the link, the unwholesome link that you make with the objects of your mind from moment to moment that causes delusion to grow and grow and grow. The hindrances are the food of delusion. So it's not what is going on in this moment. It's not what you are experiencing. But don't misunderstand this to mean that you can be mindful of sex. This is missing the point. If you are mindful of what's between you and that act, you will see that there is craving there, there is fear, there's a lot of wanting. If there wasn't that wanting and that desire, you wouldn't be able to do anything like that. If there is peace, tranquility, letting go, stillness, kindness, loving kindness, there would be no possibility of that sexuality ever arising in your mind. Mindfulness is focused on the wrong thing, just like a John Samito's mindfulness. When focused on Wat Papong and all its faults, was focused on the wrong thing. That's why Ajahn Cha said, it's not Wat Papong's fault, it's the way you are relating to it, the way you are looking at it, the way you are regarding it. I have been practicing that in my life for a long time now, especially when I have to do things every moment, when I have to do a job, travel, talk to people, relate to people, answer stupid questions, in particular when I am tired. Whatever it is, it's not the experience that is the cause of suffering to me, it's how I look at it, and how I am relating to this thing I am being asked to do. It's what's in between the observer and this thing, this task at hand. Even this talk now, it's not the talk itself but how I am relating to giving this talk that I am focusing on, I am making sure that it is a pure relationship. The mindfulness, the awareness of that can actually see where craving comes from, where desire comes from, where pride comes from, where ill will comes from, and where fear comes from because that is its breeding ground. If I'm tired, when I start meditating, the tiredness is the object of the mind. It's what is between me and that tiredness that matters. Am I getting angry and upset at that tiredness? Why am I so tired? If you are angry or upset you are actually feeding the hindrances. It's not the tiredness that is the problem, tiredness is natural but the disturbing of the tiredness. So, I have learned from a John Chas teaching, it's not the sound that disturbs you, it's you disturbing the sound. The problem is not that life or scissor disturb you. It's the disturbance that you put in between the observer and the observed. That is the problem. Once you start to look at that you find out how easy it is to meditate. I don't know what you do when you sit down and you close your eyes, but don't just look at the object in your mind, look at how you are looking at it. Are you actually creating peace? Are you creating freedom? Or are you just creating more desire, more wanting? more ill will, more frustration, or more fear? Look at where those things arise from. And once you get the idea of putting your mindfulness in that space between the observer and the observed, you will see the play of all the defilements. Where are they coming from? They are coming from the stupidity of the mind. It's only because you don't look in the right place that delusions can grow. Once you spot that, area which is the cause and source of these defilements and hindrances, you can put your mindfulness there and see this whole process happening. When you start to see that, it's so easy. Whatever you have to experience, even if it's a sore throat right now, a disappointment, or something that doesn't go right, who cares? 
it's not the event you have to experience, it's how you are experiencing it. So, even if it is pain or things I don't like, I make sure I watch between the observer and that unpleasant experience and put peace and freedom there. I never put craving there, or desire, or wanting it to be different. I never put ill will there or the thought. Why me? This is not right. I never put control there, thinking I can do something about it. It's about non-doing, putting a piece of non-doing between me and the object that I am looking at. It says in the Buddha's second sermon, the teaching on non-self, the Anatalakkana Sutta, SN 22, 59, that if these objects of the mind were yours to control, you could say to them, may you be like this, may you be like that. These objects are anatta, not me, not mine, not a self, you can't do anything about them, said the Buddha. So leave them alone, let them go. Whether it's rupa, bodily things, material things, or whether it's feelings, perceptions, mental formations, or consciousness, leave them alone. They just arise and fall according to their conditions. It's not me, it's not mine, it's not a self, it's just an empty process. Nothing to do with me. So, I can put that freedom between myself, as the observer, and the object. This is just one way of looking at it. By saying the observer is not a self or an essential me, and by putting that peace between the observer and the observed, there is no possibility for the hindrances to grow. The hindrances are suppressed by that means. By focusing my mindfulness there rather than on my breath or whatever else, I'm suppressing the hindrances. When the hindrances are suppressed, especially Desire and ill will the wanting, controlling, doing, I also suppress all of the other hindrances. Sloth and torpor always comes, as you've heard me say before dash. Because you have been controlling so much. You've been doing so much your mind. Is actually tired, and worn out. It wants to rest, it wants to turn off because it has no energy left. So if sloth and torpor is in front of me I just put peace between myself and the sloth and torpor. I do not put one of the first two hindrances between me and that sloth and torpor, I don't put desire, ill will, or fear there, and I have no sense of shame because I'm tired. It's just the body that's all. It's just the mind that's all. It's the five khandas doing their thing, nothing to do with me. So I never feel any sense of self with the sloth and torpor that comes up from time to time. I make peace with it, I allow it to be, and I let it go. I don't fight it, and by not fighting it I'm not cultivating the first two hindrances. Because I'm not cultivating the first two hindrances, mindfulness starts to grow in intensity. And because I am not feeding this doer. The mindfulness gets all the energy, the knower gets all the energy. The knower is mindfulness, and I'm energizing mindfulness. Sloth and torpor don't last very long these days, I work so hard and sometimes can't find time to sleep. I should be the monk nodding most in this monastery do the amount of work I do, but I find I can go on retreats and sit in front of hundreds of people meditating and I feel awake. The reason I can do that is because I don't feed the defilements. Mindfulness is right there, not on the sloth and torpor, not on the knower, but in between them. I want to see what I'm doing with the sloth and torpor. Am I reacting with controlling? Am I just being one of the allies of Mara, the great controller? I don't do that. I put my mindfulness between the sloth and torpor and the observer, making sure I'm being kind to the sloth and torpor. Kindness overcomes the ill will. Too often when you have sloth and torpor it is aversion that feeds it. It is the thought, I don't want it, that actually feeds sloth and torpor and makes it last longer, because it is taking the energy away from knowing 
It is the same with restlessness and remorse, when the mind is thinking all over the place. How are you relating to that? What are you doing with it? Put the energy of mindfulness between the knower and that restlessness. Don't put your mindfulness on aversion or on desire. Dash I don't want to be restless or this restlessness is good. I am thinking of all these fantasies and plans about Star Wars or whatever. Dash but notice instead how you are regarding that thought pattern in your mind. If you see ill will or desire, those first two hindrances, stomp on them, stop them. If you see them as soon as they arise, then it is very easy to stop these things. If you are not looking in the right place, you can't stop them. So once you put your mindfulness in the correct place, between the observer and the observed, between the siddha and the restlessness, it's very easy to see why these things are going on. We can very often say that restlessness comes from discontent and that discontent comes from either ill will or desire, wanting something else, wanting something more, not wanting this. So if we see where that discontent arises, that is, between you and that restless object, then you can stop it. It's fascinating to see how soon restlessness disappears. Sometimes within seconds, you can just cut the thoughts that easily. But don't use force and effort, because that's aversion. You can't cut restlessness and remorse by being heedless, by waiting for them to stop, because underneath you want these things to carry on, you desire them, and you want them to happen. Look at what's between you and that thing and then you see what's feeding them. So you put your mindfulness there, and then restlessness doesn't last very long. Nor does remorse. Because remorse is always reacting to the past with desire and ill will. It is the same with doubt, another form of restlessness. Look between you and the object that you are aware of and put peace in there, put acceptance in there, put patience in there. And you'll find out later you don't need to ask that question right. Now, to ask that question right. Now, to ask that question right. Now, to 